Hi, good evening to everyone. I'm Dr. Philip McMillan. Thank you for joining me. For anyone who has been following me, they should know that my focus since very early in the pandemic was autoimmunity, where effectively I said even severe COVID-19 and the cytokine storm was just about how the virus triggered the immune system to attack itself. So instead of the immune system just fighting against the virus, it starts to attack normal proteins and cells in the body. That's the principle of autoimmunity. And so this conversation about the horrendous rise in liver disease was triggered because of somebody who liked to look at data. And so I'll always give credit to people who have come up with the data in the first place. And so it has made sure that what I'll do is within the next just about nine days, I have put together another presentation with regards to the same question. Horrendous rise in liver disease, what could be the cause? What are the potential mechanisms? And so this will be an event um, on a webinar for which you can click on the link below to register. A number of tickets are free and the others are donation and every donation is acceptable. And we want your support to continue to produce this kind of content. So please click on the link below. Now, it's important for me not to always talk about the elephant in the room. I think it's important because if we don't deal with an elephant in the room, we can't properly manage all of the situations that we're seeing around us. And so and again, anyone who has been following me would recognize that I always talk about the elephant in the room. What I'm starting to realize is that it's not helping as much as I would like. What I mean by that is that politicians, it seems, industry, don't want to talk about the elephant in the room, and it's causing them to not respond to real crisis in front of us. So here is where I'm going to give you the example of what I mean. So just today, I saw a very interesting tweet. And so this is on uh, Twitter, and it was by outside Allen, and he's somebody who always produces data, and he was talking about monthly excess deaths by cause of death, okay? Really interesting breakdown of the data. And he used this um, Office of Health Improvements and Disparities, excess mortality in, the, in England. He used this to try and break it down. So if anyone wants to go and do the work themselves and see if they agree with his conclusions, please go ahead and do it. But I've been following him for some time. And so I find that his information tends to be very, very accurate. So I'll show you what caught my attention today. And this is why I've put together this presentation. And you'll see the work that he's done, and he's been doing it for some time. So this is a breakdown of excess mortality by um, percentage, above the normal percentage. And this time what he's done, he's broken it down by condition. I'm going to zoom in, but first, just so that you get an overview of it. Now, right at the bottom here, and I'll pull it down so that you know what the colors are, it, Green or dark green is less than 10% below the, um, the standard deviation. Less than 5% is light green. Zero is yellow. Slightly greater than zero up to 5% is orange. Greater than 5% is red. Dark red is greater than 10%. And greater than 15% above is black. So what he then did is that he positioned it based on time. So again, you have to look at the timeline to make sense of this. So we pull to the top, and what he's done is he's gone from 2020. This is March, third month in 2020. And then he has gone down all the way to the 12th month here, which is December 2023. So that you can see it here, December 2023. So he's done it over the whole timeline up until about a month and a half ago. Then what he has done is he's broken it down by condition. And this is where I found it really important. This is what caught my attention. And he's broken it down into there's heart failure, there is cirrhosis and other liver disease, there is ischemic heart disease, there's respiratory disease, cerebrovascular disease, strokes, all circulatory disease, where they combine them together, there's like diabetes, other circulatory diseases, diseases of the urinary tract, 
cancer. So he's broken it down into all these conditions. So because of the coloring, you can then look very quickly and see what it is that stands out. And so this is what caught my attention. As soon as I looked at it today, that jumped out at me and I thought, I need to try and understand it. And so when we go back to his work, we can see here that in black, there are three things that stand out right here. As we said, this one here is heart failure. So it's still black and dark red up until now. This one here is ischemic heart disease. So this is heart attacks and so on. And so this was, this is about in 2022. It has come down a bit, but it's still above average up to the end of 2023. But this one caught my attention because I did not expect it. Cirrhosis and liver related diseases. And this was extremely high in late 2022 going into 2023 and still largely remains elevated. So you can see that here, we are talking about percentages above 20% here. This is in, um, in June 2022. This was in June 2023, and in May, it was 24% above the baseline. So this is quite significant uh, when we, we look at it. As we can see here, uh, up until the end of uh, the month, it was coming down a bit, 10%, 5%. And then it has lowered a bit here at the end of 2023. It will be interesting to see what 2024 is like. But it caught my attention because, as I said, I'm trying to explain disease. So it's not just about criticizing who has done what or who has, hasn't done what. I'm very interested in patients. And if diseases are affecting patients, especially patients that I may have to look at, I want to try and understand what are the mechanisms and how could it be relevant? So the liver is really, really important. And for anyone who has had damage to their liver from alcohol or otherwise needing a liver transplant, it, it demonstrates that it is essential to life. And cirrhosis of the liver is quite a common condition. And here are some of the big conditions that tend to affect the liver. This is an example of a healthy liver. This is chronic hepatitis. Hepatitis always, always means inflammation, itis. Um, this is cirrhosis of the liver. So this one is shrunken and, um, and irregular. This is usually, say, from something like alcohol. Alcoholic liver disease tends to be cirrhotic. And then you have cancer of the liver as well. So these are three big conditions, not the only ones, but three big conditions that can occur. And in this case, hepatitis leads to cirrhosis, which then goes to hepatocellular carcinoma. So it's important to understand diseases that affect the liver. And I remember early in the pandemic when I saw ferritin levels being quite elevated, I thought that was pointing to liver damage. In reality, it probably was pointing to macrophage activation, but the point is liver was still involved in the context of COVID. Now, I'm going to show you just a little bit about a paper, and I'll be discussing this paper. And as a reminder for you, remember the webinar coming up uh, on Thursday, uh, the 29th of, um, of February, so just in nine days' time. Remember that. But I was particularly interested in a paper here, Autoimmune Liver Diseases and SARS-CoV-2. And this is where I think we really need people to start thinking about the science. So here we have a paper looking, this is in March 2023, so probably just a little over a year ago. And what they were looking at here is that they have recognized that severe uh, acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus, it's SARS-CoV-2, causing coronavirus disease 2019 can trigger autoimmunity in genetically predisposed individuals. So this is the point that I keep on talking about. Autoimmunity is the monster in the room. And it's through hyperstimulation of the immune system and molecular mimicry. So they are pointing out that autoimmunity certainly is a part of the disease. And they're now looking to see, well, what causes or what are some of the mechanisms in the context of the liver? 
And so here is what they have found. So when they looked at um, the causes, the current knowledge about autoimmune liver disease and SARS-CoV-2, they were looking at it from a number of points. And so from the data derived from the literature, it suggests that patients who already have autoimmune liver disease do not carry increased risk of SARS-CoV-2 infection. Now, isn't that interesting? But they're on immune suppression. That's a separate uh, discussion. So they note that although SARS-CoV-2 infection can lead to the development of several autoimmune diseases, few reports correlate it to the appearance of immune-mediated liver disease, such as autoimmune hepatitis. So it can occur, but only a few papers were talking about it. Now, again, it comes back to, well, if it can occur in the context of infection, can it also occur in the context of the elephant in the room? Sadly, I still have to refer to it as that. Um, and here you have here, and they're talking about in this case, so different case series. So this is a, 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 a few reports correlate to the appearance. Um, uh, um, where is it now? It's right here. So they have said, although the causal link between SARS-CoV-2 vaccines and autoimmune hepatitis cannot definitively be established, these reports suggest that this association could be more than coincidental. I'm just showing you this paper here, but there's another paper that I've got prepped where we know that it can occur. Now, it's not that common, or we presume it's not that common, because without biopsies and autopsies, you don't really know, because the liver tends not to produce disease until almost 20% is left. So after 80% of damage, you start to see the enzymes rising and so on. So mild liver disease, a mild inflammation with autoimmunity can easily go undetected unless you are specifically looking at it. That's one of the problems with autoimmunity. But the point that I want to make is that people keep on going either infection or vaccination? No. I tell you this, and this is what I hope that you can understand. It's when you combine it. I've got their baking soda with vinegar. This is what happens when you combine it. There is a significant increase in the response on combination. And so what I'm worried about is that if you have immune priming, and then you continually get infection, does it lead to more significant autoimmune responses, especially in the context of the liver? And so the people who would be primarily at risk are people who are putting their liver under stress anyway. And that's where, if this is the case, they need to be advised that their threshold is likely to be significantly reduced. And to give you a simple example, it could mean if you normally, if you're drinking high amounts of alcohol and somebody is normally drinking three or four bottles of wine a week, they may find that their threshold now is only two to two and a half bottles. And if you go beyond that, you significantly speed up the risk of liver disease. These are the kinds of things that we really need to understand. Who is affected? How is it impacted? What can be done to mitigate it? And remember, this is about infection as well as the elephant in the room. And the point I keep on making, don't underestimate what happens when you combine them as to exactly this is what's happening at this stage of the pandemic. It wasn't expected. It shouldn't have occurred because everyone thought that there would no longer be significant levels of circulating virus. It's still circulating. It will still be triggering autoimmunity and potentially doing serious damage. There's still a lot of research to be done. But again, if you want to join me, click on the link below. Join us on this here on Thursday, the 29th of February. Um, free tickets and donation tickets are available. Join us. We'll be very happy to have you. And for all who are listening, have a great evening.